Wanda, I'm glad that we could have some time to talk about your career, the early stages of it, of course, since since you're relatively new on the scene, and yeah. also about your album, um, Smile. But before we get started, since you are a winner of the Sarah Vaughn International Vocal Competition, I do want to ask you about something she said, Miss Sarah Vaughn herself. She said, I just get on stage and sing. I don't think about how I'm going to do it. It's too complicated. Is she right? And do you think instinct is more important than thought when performing? Oh, I love that. Um, it's definitely, you know, I as speaking as someone who is diving ever deeper into their performance and the way that I tell my stories, I'm trying to go from a place of thinking to a place of simply just um, being a conduit for the music and the story. So I absolutely do think she, she's right. I think when you're overthinking, it hinders your expression. Um, but of course, with with genres like jazz, there is a lot of thought um, and intention that goes into it, especially if you're improvising. Um, you do kind of have to be aware of your surroundings um, and aware of the chords that are passing and things like that. So there's definitely, you know, she's definitely correct. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. <laughs> so as, as a, a younger artist, what is the process for you of learning to trust that instinct? It requires a deep vulnerability um, that is just, I think of, of any artist is kind of the journey um, I think so often we get wrapped up in maybe like comparing ourselves to other people or, um, or yeah, just kind of overthinking, you know, the way we are being perceived or something. But for me, it's just about kind of staying grounded in the moment, um, feeding off of, you know, the musicians that I'm with and kind of co-creating a space to deliver a message. So yeah, to put it more simply, um, yeah, I think just being, just staying present is very important in that process. Now, your album Smile was recorded in the early days of the pandemic, and in a video that's on Renaissance Records website, you you say, state that, that you set out to offer hope, quote, to a world that was changing so much. What did the album give you? Um, the album gave me belief in myself and strength um i always refer to the song titled i'm okay which was made uh, popular by diane reeves because during that time i really wasn't okay <laughs> i was like having to show up to the studio feeling like you know there was so much on my mind and um and just you know struggling for the first time quite seriously with with um, mental health issues like depression and anxiety. And then to get into the studio and sing these songs and most specifically songs like I'm okay. That's very assertive, very strong um, statement of, you know, all of these things have happened in my life and here I am now. And you know what? I'm okay. That was more of a manifestation um, and kind of almost maybe a prayer for me during that time. So it just gave me that, that strength um and you know being so influenced by the the person who produced it george clavin he really thought that those messages were important not only for me during that time but just for um for everyone else in a time of of great confusion um so yeah for me it was really like i i got a lot of uh prayers and manifestations from that process Definitely. One would like to believe that we're on the back end of this crisis that we've been through for three years. Mm -hmm. um, so given everything that went into making the album for you personally and emotionally, not just, you know, vocally, what's your relationship when you hear the album now, a couple of years after you recorded it? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's so funny listening back to it. It's, um, you, I always wish that I could have, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that you're exactly where you need to be at every moment. 
um, during the time we were recording it, I did not feel ready. Um, and listening back, I think I sometimes get in my head about, um, you know, these are quite difficult songs and they're pretty involved. And, um, and I wish that I could have, you know, approached them with, with uh, the all of the growth that I've done between now and then. Um, I'll probably get the chance to do so and I and I will get the chance to do so as I continue to perform them now but I definitely listen back to the album and I just I can hear that um, that I don't know uh, it, it's almost like I can hear that little girl it's it's like a little girl at least for me I can I I, I what I considered myself so much younger at that time <laughs> because I feel like during this time I we all grew up so much somehow it seems like we just kind of shot from for me it almost felt like a loss of innocence and I don't mean that in a very serious way I just mean that I really like kind of woke up and so um yeah after after having woken up listening to back to it it definitely feels like gosh all the growth I've done between now and then is um it's striking to say the least. <laughs> well, Tawanda, what's striking to me is that it sounds like the work of a mature audience uh, uh, artist, not not somebody who's making their first album. Mm. And I also think it's really ambitious to do an album that's nearly an hour in length. You know, mm -hmm. with you know the tradition of jazz vocal albums has been it's about thirty five minutes mm. or so. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to like you know we're talking about in the fifties and sixties, you know, albums yeah. were shorter. I love that we get this whole journey on the album. So you begin with Smile and you end with an acapella version of Smile. Mm -hmm. How How is your relationship at the beginning of Smile altered by the, the time you get to the acapella version? <sighs> Gotta sit with that for a moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just... um. You know, it's lovely to open with a song that everybody knows and loves and um, a song that is so popular. And then I think by the end of the album, if you listen to it the whole way through start to finish, which I hope that people do, um, then it kind of takes on a more, yeah, as you said, you've you've been through this this whole journey, you've been through through yeah, something as simple as as reminding people to smile to heartache and pain to these like this, you know, love, this love song between you and the moon to um, to kind of just setting your intentions for dreams and hope and joy. And then at the end, I think, yeah, I, I think I would just echo your sentiments as that it is very like, it's kind of just yeah, like a, a well-rounded journey. And um, I guess listening to it back in my head as I'm talking to you, it does seem kind of like a mature delivery of um, of life. I, I would definitely agree with that. So yeah, and then uh, Josh Nelson, who arranged um, most of the songs on the album, he had the idea of doing that acapella and um, kind of putting it somewhere within the album. And I'm really glad we ended up choosing the end because it's, it's kind of like a, a moment of reflection. Um, yeah. That's what it feels like. Well, I'll get back to the song, you know, in a minute, cause I do want to ask you about it, but since you brought up the arrangements, I think the arrangements on this album are incredible. Um, how important is the arrangement for you so that you can, you know, build the story you want to tell with your singing. And those arrangements have to be a part of that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that I had a little bit more creative liberty and direction um, during the second half of the, uh, the, you know, when we were deciding on the arrangements with Josh, um, Tamir Hendelman and George kind of um, came up with the the most of the ideas for the first tracks um so yeah I think and you know this whole process this was my first ever recorded jazz project so um I really I'm still there's still so much I'm learning um and so from start to finish I think I ended up learning a lot and then had more more to share more to say more um ideas that I wanted reflected in those arrangements 
but they're incredibly important. Um, everything down to, you know, when the band, when, when everyone is soloing and when we're all coming back together and when we're doing like, when we're, when we're singing motifs in the arrangements, it's so important. Every small part is, um, is essential to the piece. And that's why I'm so grateful that I was able to work with the greats like Tamir Handelman and Josh Nelson on those arrangements, because I think, um, yeah, I can't even imagine what it would have been like without them. They're just so brilliant. So, yeah. Whose idea was it to put the five five note pattern from Close Encounters at the beginning and end of Out of This World? As <laughs> I heard that, I, as, <laughs> as soon as I heard that, I thought, "Oh my God, that is so clever!" Yeah, yeah, that's all Tamir. He's he's brilliant. I love that he did that too. Definitely added um a nice color to it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you have to be of a certain age to know what that music is from Close Encounters, but I thought it was very smart. I would say so. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you, when you sing a song like Smile that the world does know, because there have been countless recordings of it, what are the challenges that you give yourself so that your approach to the song is something we haven't heard before? Yeah, it's funny, you know, um, <laughs> I think I think um, I'm going to go off on a little tangent and then I'll get right back to the point. But I think it's it's the word smile, um, especially to women, always takes on a kind of different tone to it because we're kind of taught to, we're, we're, we're conditioned to be these happy, smiling creatures all of the time. And um, and as I said, during the during the time we were recording this, I didn't want to be that person. I was like, no, I'm literally down in the dumps. Why am I singing about smile? And so it ended up being so healing for me because I needed that reminder. But um, yeah, I think for me, it was just like that, that is, that is what influenced me most to, to perform it the way that I did on the album was just like, it was more coming from a place of, oh, I need this reminder. I may not always feel this way, but I need this reminder. How do we smile when our heart is aching? and breaking and remind ourselves that after moments of rain and cloudiness the sun comes through and um and and things you know get better and they always get better and then they, they go back and then they go forward you know it's like this never-ending cycle of of ups and downs so yeah I just kind of let that guide me now I would I would assume as somebody who nobody in the world wants to ever hear sing um, and I'm talking about myself here. Nobody wants to hear me sing, but I would as, I would assume that that there's a lot of pressure that an artist puts on themselves when they're making their first album. That milestone is behind you now. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like moving forward there is less internalized pressure or industry pressure? You know, for what follows. I think so. Yes. And it's always been my plan to do other kinds of music too. So I see this as a very huge milestone, but I know it's, it's not the end and it's certainly not uh reflective, like, um, you know, it doesn't reflect what will be to come. It really feels like um, a first project. It feels like something, you know, that had so many other insights on it you know I didn't come up with everything start to finish I was just kind of like you know presented with a lot of it and and then um and then I did it and I and I trusted the producer um because he's really been taking me under his wing but I look forward in the future and I'm I have some things in the works now where I do have more creative liberty and it shows different sides of me and it does reflect um more of who I am as well so um, yeah, you know, the pressure is definitely real. And I definitely had some moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, is this, is this good enough? I, I, I certainly hope it is. I, I, you know, um, but now I have, I have more of an understanding about how, how, you know, the intention that goes into these things and, um, and I've gained a voice throughout all of this as well. Like I am able to say, oh, I didn't really like that. Let's do that again. Or let's try something new. Let's come with a new approach. Um, so I gained that skill throughout all of that. And I'm so excited to put that to work, um, now. Are there expectations on an artist after winning a competition like you did? Probably. Uh, yeah, I would say that's, 
yeah, it, it's like, um, um, and I love that. And, the, and there should be, you know, there, there, it's like these judges really, they see something in you. They, they, they trust your vision. And, um, I'm sure that everybody who is rooting for us is hoping for the best and hoping for more. And so, um, yeah, it's not that I, you know, I, it's, I don't have a lot of people being like, you got to do this, you got to do this, but it's really just like, I have so much support after something like that, especially because it was my first ever jazz competition. Um, I didn't think I was going to win. I really didn't. I was like, I, I kind of just, um, I'm trying this out. I'm, I will be the first to admit that I have so much to learn. I don't come from a background of musicians. So literally who knows? So yeah, I, it's a, it's a, I, with great pride and honor, I accepted the award and knew that I have to keep it going. Yeah. hundred percent. I want, I watched the ceremony this morning before our conversation. Okay. And, and of course I was very thrilled for you that you won. Um, and in the interest of, of being fair here, it was a tie, the first ever tie. It was a tie, yes. It was a tie. I felt so bad for the woman who didn't win because the look on her, the look on her face was just heartbreaking, I even know. though it's got to be amazing just to be on that stage in that competition because so many people mm -hmm. try to get on that stage. Absolutely. And I will take this moment to say Haley Brunell is brilliant. She is so brilliant. Um, I, we still, you know, chat here and there and I follow her on Instagram and she's, she's got the chops. Like that was never a question. So, um, yeah, I, I even aspire to be to that level of, um, of improvisation. And it, I mean, it helps so much that she plays her instrument, um, so well. So yeah, I know, I, I, I know. <laughs> well, some, that's the nature of competition, right? That's just what happens unfortunately. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, you said, you know, that a jazz record isn't the only thing you want to do. What are the other things that are on, on your list of things you'd like to play with? Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting into songwriting again, which is really exciting for me. It's a very, um, it's just, it's, it's a process that I, I wasn't quite ready to do, uh, over the past few years because I was like, just kind of getting my bearings again, but my original music is more, um, I guess you could say like singer songwriter with kind of like a, like a soulful, maybe like R and B vocal. Um, but I'm also heavily influenced by my, my history of like choral music. So I really love like, um, orchestra and like lots of voices layered. And I'm really into like electronic music. I love house music. I love things like disco. So I have a lot of different, oh, and then of course my, from my parents, I have a whole bunch of world music just like swirling around in my head. So yeah, I'm really excited to just kind of like do, I, I want almost like every project I do to feel kind of like a mixtape of different um, influences. Cause I think, um, yeah, I'm just so inspired and influenced by so many different things. It's kind of hard to just nail, nail me down in one way. And I'm really excited to share my original music because I think it's I don't know I think I have a lot of good things to say so yeah well and I've I've spoken to a lot of jazz artists who sort of feel like even just using the word jazz is limiting mm -hmm. because there isn't any one form of jazz you can't listen to what Vijay Iyer does and then listen to you know Walter Smith the third for instance you know going from a pianist to a to a saxophone player admittedly but you can't listen to those and and say that's that's just one type of jazz. I think I think we're living in a world where where genres are more marketing tools as opposed to actual reflections of what music is. Beautifully said. I totally agree. Thank you. Speaking of beautifully said, before you sang <laughs> at this at the Saravon competition, I guess I'll hang my tears to out to dry that you were doing a song about endurance, which is quote a skill I've been honing. Mm -hmm. You're in the early stages of a career where endurance is definitely something that's going to be required of you. Mm -hmm. Does does the world today for any music artist, regardless of genre, is it infinitely more complicated than it might have been 25 years ago? Um, given the way media you know, music is is parsed out 
you know, online versus through physical sales. Um, and, you know, making a living as an artist either comes from touring and selling, you know, merchandise or, or music on tour. You know, how do you navigate all of that? What is the way to making this a successful career for you and a way of making a living? Yeah. Whew, I know. Yeah. I, that's something I think of every single day because I am someone who I do not currently survive just off of music. I can't, I mean, I live in LA rent is like over a grand, you know what I mean? I'm like, I work full time. I have to, there's no other choice. Um, I'm looking forward to a day when I can supplement all of my income with my art, but, um, yeah, it's definitely changed a lot, I would say. Um, and with social media too, it's so interesting. I, I had this, you know, when TikTok was like cropping up and stuff, I had such an aversion to it, even though there was a time in my life when I felt totally comfortable sharing literally each and everything about my life. But then during COVID, I was off of Instagram and social media for a year, a whole year, which nobody else that I know can say that can say that there no but no other young person that I know can say they were off of social media for a year and during that time I was just like oh my god it feels so good to not have to exist in multiple places at one time I can just be me myself and this is how people engage with me and observe me it's in person and it's beautiful and I prefer that and so um, you know, as we started recording this album, I started doing more shows. It became a requirement for me to be back on social media. That's just how the world works now. It isn't like you, you know, you can record an album and tour and that's all you do. Now it's almost like you really have to find a persona that is marketable and, and become kind of like... <laughs> I mean, I hate to say this, but like a prostitute of sorts on social media, because like you're literally every day, like, you know, every aspect of yourself, you you have to like, I don't know, be comfortable with, I don't know, it's, it's, it's so tricky. If I think about it, it really kind of breaks my brain because it's this, it's this thing of like, artists need to be vulnerable to create um, and authentic, but is it truly authentic? if every moment that we're sharing is curated it's this huge philosophical question that i think we'll have to kind of be diving into as social media and like technology and things kind of like ever more creech into like our way of living but um yeah it's definitely it's definitely tough i'm like finally getting back to a place um where i can just be myself and just feel comfortable sharing that about me but i definitely think i haven't i i, I want to be even more authentic and i'm realizing the sacrifices that i will have to make to be my most authentic self like not everyone will understand all parts of me and i kind of just have to um be okay with that and um so yeah, it's a, it's definitely a journey. You have to be careful, but um, you also you also have to build a fan base and build connections with people and be yourself. So it's a lot. It is a lot, and you have to figure out how much is enough and what you could how much you can protect yourself in the process. Right. Yeah, it's tough. Um, which leads me to something you said in also in the promotional video that is on Resonance Records website, and you were quoting your sister. I think who said, I don't, I don't think people understand jazz if they haven't had heartbreak. Does that mean your understanding of this music also comes from that heartbreak? Oh yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. Um, I'm so influenced by the pain that I have felt in life. Um, the abandonment, um, the moments where I had no other choice, but to live creatively because there was maybe like like a, a need, like, like money or, um, or, or I've never struggled with food. I love to eat. So I will, I will find food. Food is easy to find. Um, but you know, yeah, I just think, you know, as someone who, you know, yeah, I, I just, as someone who is very independent, there are 
those things that sometimes you find yourself maybe lacking and it puts you into the kind of survival mode, but it just kind of ends up informing your life and allowing you to be more creative. So, and then you can apply all of those experiences. You can use all of those experiences as different colors to better paint these pictures with. And I feel like I've always had this kind of like old, sad soul, not sad, but sad in the way that I, I love to analyze, um, like hurt. I love to like feel things very deeply. I feel like very sensitive. And so I feel like those things really help me, um, when I am creating. Well, and God knows there's, pl there are plenty of songs to sing about hurt. Mm -hmm out there um now you mentioned that you're based here in los angeles um where i am as well many jazz musicians tell me that they are frustrated by the fact that there isn't a great place to play in la unless you're you know diane reeves and you can book walt disney concert hall um or be invited to perform at walt disney Con concert hall mm. what do you think the jazz scene is like here in los angeles is there are there good places that you know that people may not have recognized yet yeah, um, I would definitely, I mean, you know, what I wish I had is a regular gig, but I am so grateful, especially for this year. Um, I've just gotten so many opportunities and I'll, I'll take a moment to shout out the clubs that I've been performing at. But um, here in town, I would say it's mostly like Herb Alpert's Vibrato and Beverly Glen. Um, there's Sam's First right next to the airport. Um, I just did a, a show at the Sunrose with um, Mike Garson, and that wasn't straight ahead jazz. That was kind of like, um, I would say like art rock, but I brought that jazz element to it. And that's really important to me. Um, I, yeah, just did a show at the Cicada Club for the JEXA Awards show. So I know that there's definitely there's definitely stuff ha happening there and there's Catalina jazz club. There is Kulak's um, woodshed, which is a super cool place that I think they normally do, do rock and singer songwriter stuff too. But we just did a, we just did a, I just went over there the other day to, to sing with a, a guitarist and to watch another fantastic vocalist based here named Kana Shimanuki uh, perform there and and the man you know after the show was like hey we don't really get a lot of jazz musicians in here this was so cool like we would love for you guys to come back um because it's so different you know you you get he's like to have musicians of that caliber in this space is so wonderful so I think I mean the opportunities are endless I have so many friends here who are like gigging every single week doing a lot of things I think it just takes a moment to get into your stride and build that community. That's something I, I wasn't doing so much in the past two years that I'm so grateful for the past few months has actually uh, come into fruition, but it's more about who you know. LA is all about who you know. I think New York, you take a subway to the next station and there's like maybe three jazz clubs there, you know, there it's everywhere, but here it's a little more spread out and um, and it's who you know. I don't know too much about like jazz jams happening. There are definitely a few. I just haven't, you know, I work, don't always have time to do it. Um, so I would say maybe less accessible, but once you're in the know, there's definitely stuff happening. Yeah. So if people want to find out what you're doing, because I know there's not a lot of listings on your on on your website with tours. Is, is social mm -hmm. media the best way for people to find out where you'll be? Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes things crop up that I just don't have time to put on my website. So yeah, social media is definitely a good way to, um, to stay connected with me. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, since you're so good at improvisation, which we can hear on the album and, and scatting in addition to beautiful singing, I want to ask you about something that George Gershwin said. Mm -hmm. He said, life is a lot like jazz. It's best when you improvise. How do your jazz skills help you improvise and navigate your way through life? Yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about my parents because I think they were my original improvisers uh, with life. Um, I'm a first generation American. My mom's from Germany. My dad is from Mozambique in Africa. And he ended up in Germany um, before the wall 
well, yeah, I guess when the wall was up. So yeah, he was, you know, on one side of Germany, my mom was on the other side, the wall came down, they met, and then they ended up moving here um, to the United States. So they're, they're travelers and not only travelers, but like people like my dad, he's had to flee countries where there were civil wars happening, like things we can't even imagine. We have been very privileged and blessed to, to um, not have to experience, but I think those things just make you more creative period because you're 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 you can't always rely on on where you're at you have to have a plan for where you're going and maybe not necessarily a plan but you have to get really good at kind of just like picking up and leaving going with the flow and so i think that aspect of life was shown to me and my sister from a young age and it's definitely influenced the way that i i live my life i feel like a a pretty depend independent person um and I feel like I love change I love change and I love getting creative with life as I said like um and I love getting creative with each individual moment like creating something out of nothing like um I love to cook I love to garden I love to like take my time with things and just like watch them unfold and so I, I feel like that has influenced my improvisation, but there's still a lot, you know, there's still a lot, a lot of chops you need to learn that can't just be in, like influenced by your upbringing. Like for now, if for example, I'm like in the process of learning more, like transcribing more horn solos, for example, and then letting those kind of influence my improv which is really important it's like a language you have to learn so I'm still I'm, I'm like working on um learning that language but it's definitely been a life full of improv I can tell you that <laughs> and I've had a lot of fun with it <laughs> well good well as long as you keep creating music like like this album then you know I think everybody's going to be a lot happier in their own lives as well <laughs> I love that thank you